And I remind you that David was the man after God's own heart in every facet of his life. He was the man after God's own heart as a young boy, as just a teenager when God called him. He was a man after God's own heart as he was exalted to the highest station in life that was possible at that time, as the leader of the people of God, as a, a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he's so often portrayed in the Messianic Psalms, the coronation of David, looking onward to the coming crowning of Christ. He's also the man after God's own heart as he goes through a very normal part of life. And that is when we go through the valleys, when we go through the times of difficulty and the times of refining. But when we say David's name, even its mention makes us think of so many different things. David was a warrior who was fearless as he approached incalculable risk and, and total odds set against him. He was fearless. He was a matchless poet who could bring the glories of heaven right down and distill them into the beauties of the earth. And he lifts our worship Godward. He was a musician, and, and as you note, many of his psalms, it'll say, to the tune of the lilies or the, to the tune of whatever, Alamoth, as it says sometimes. He was an incredible musician who used those gifts and blended all of those poetic and musical gifts into worship for God. He was a father, a successful and an unsuccessful father. He had many uh, joys and many sorrows. He was a king. He was the king that God picked as Saul was the king after man's choice and David was the king that God chose. He was a shepherd. He had learned well from the, the ignorance of those uh, very often uh, difficult animals, sheep, and he learned and he used that knowledge to help him exalt his Lord. He was an outdoorsman who often would look at the beautiful book of creation and then through revelation merge those into bringing us great truths about God under the moving and inspiration of God's spirit. And yes, he was a sinner and his sin before all was exposed and his sin was desired to be used as God broke him, as God convicted him, as God cleansed him as a model. And in the days to come, we are going to look at those two magnificent psalms that come out of that time in his life when he at first hid his sins and then when he confessed his sins. But most of all, we know David as a saint. As he truly lived and died and is remembered through the pages of scriptures, and he's exalted as the man, the saint, after God's own heart. But we most clearly have seen David when we view him through the eyes of the Holy Spirit's special accounts of various events in his life. I remind you, we saw in 1 Samuel 17, we saw him standing alone for God. Do you remember the account? David and Goliath, probably a favorite of children, a favorite even of ours as we think about the, the ultimate moment of the enemies of God standing against the lone one who stood up for God and God overwhelmed all those odds that were against David. And we saw him as the one with an unchanging concern for God's name. He wanted to honor God's name wherever he was. And because of that, he was willing even to stand alone. And standing alone is not easy, but it always has great rewards because anyone plus God is a majority and even if it comes to the point as Athanasius uh, once thought he was in where we think we're the only ones standing and in the famous words of the church historian Athanasius contra mundum Athanasius against the world as he stood for the deity of Christ when the church was wavering on that topic we must learn to stand alone Stand alone at work, stand alone at school, stand alone when we are alone and the desires of the flesh might overwhelm us. We stand alone in the power of God because we're concerned for the honor of his name. Then we saw a few weeks ago in Psalm 59, we saw David depending on God. You remember he was near assassination, he was near murder as his own father-in-law was sneaking around and sending troops. Saul was trying to kill David in bed because he had an unshakable trust that God was protecting him, he depended on God. 
And I guess if we depend on God, it's because we trust him. And if we trust him, we'll depend on him. And that is the truth of God's protection. And in Psalm 34, two weeks ago, we saw David magnifying God because an unwavering awareness that God was watching him. And I think the 34th Psalm is a, a marvelous portrait of what the fear of God is all about. It's kind of a uh, looking through a porthole into his life, and he exposes his heart as he magnifies God because he knows and is so aware that God was watching him. And if you know someone's watching you and you know why they're watching you, often we will do what they're watching us to do. And if they are watching to see how we're doing our job, if it's a boss uh, doing his checkup on us, I remember when I was a salesman that I would have the, the vice presidents and the regional managers that would travel with me. They'd fly in from New York or wherever, and they would want to see how I did things. And so I knew what they were looking for. And so I would remind them that I knew how to do the job that I'd been sent to do. I remember as being uh, on extension from the university during my years there, and we would, we would have those who would follow up on our work as we were out, and they would ask us how this meeting is. We were as uh, learning the pastorate, and we'd go out and work under a, a seasoned veteran. And then the office of the extension ministries would ask us whether we did this, whether we did that. And we do what we know we're supposed to do because we're aware someone is watching how much more to magnify God because we know he's always watching us. But now Psalm 142. And if you've never categorized the Psalms, it's so important because uh, as an author a hundred years ago said that the Psalms are in everyday life an exact representation of all the myriad of emotions, all the incredible situations in life we can find ourselves. We can find ourselves in this book, Mirrored. Prothero uh, wrote that book on the Psalms, and I always, in fact, I thought it was so good, I Xeroxed the whole book. It's out of print now. Uh, it's 100 years old. I doubt if anybody would ever bother reprinting it. But he showed how every single emotion, every single difficulty we could go through is somehow mirrored in the pages of the wisdom literature and most often in the Psalms. Well, one of the ways of life we may one day be in is the way of life of having to call upon God through difficult times. And we see David in these seven verses of Psalm 142 calling on God because he had this, this hope that God was listening. Did you ever think about that? If you think someone is listening, you call. If you think someone is going to hear, you call out to them. And that's why God says that we should be constantly crying out to him because it makes us honor the fact that he is hearing. And so, as we go into this, we are reminded that David stood for God because he was concerned for God. David depended on God because he trusted in God's caring. David magnified God because he acknowledged God's watching. And right here in the 142nd Psalm, David called on God because he hoped and knew that God was hearing. Well, as we looked at the 142nd, we saw that when he got here, he was running for his life. Now, just take your right finger and set it right there by 142, and then flip back with your left hand to 1 Samuel 22, because I never want you to see this psalm apart from the setting in which David found himself. And if you wonder why, and tonight maybe you're with us for the first time uh, with this series that I'm doing on David, and you wonder why on earth is this called Confessions of a Caveman? I, I don't see the connection. Well, the first two verses of 1 Samuel 22 give for us the connection. And we have the privilege of, through God's inspiration, having some of these psalms that grew out of the historical accounts in, in the historical books. In 1 Samuel 22, David is running for his life. He has just gone through the difficulties uh, of being around Achish and, and down there in that Philistine warlord's uh, courtyard and he ran out of there like a madman at the end of 21 and now he departs from Philistia and goes due east over into the area around Bethlehem to the cave of Adullam. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam 
And his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, and they went down to him, and everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him in the cave. Must have been a large cave. Must have been a very interesting place to be with 400 men and all the other folks that probably trailed along. And so now back to Psalm 142, and if you have the superscription that is uh, just before the first verse in your Bible, if it keeps that for you, as it should, because that is in the Hebrew manuscript, it says a, a mashkil, or a, a teaching psalm of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. He is praying, and we are to learn, we are to meditate and learn through this prayer that David offered from this setting. And of course, the setting was the cave. And I shared with you last week that, first of all, that we should remember that cave times usually follow times of great victories. And they did. David had just defeated Goliath, and he did it single-handedly. David had just escaped Saul, and he didn't suffer at his hands the assassination murder that was planned. He had just gotten away from Achish and all of his enemy warlords and warriors. And after those great victories, he now is in the cave. He is now hiding and running for his very life. Also, this time is usually accompanied by great distress. Look at verse 3. My spirit was overwhelmed within me. You knew my path. And then he starts going through the fact that traps were set for him. In verse 4, no one regards me. There is no escape for me. And then kind of like the ultimate sigh of, of depression and sadness in this moment. As he is just overwhelmed in his spirit, he says, no one cares for my soul. But starting in verse 5, we find that these cave times led in his life to great discoveries about God. And this is our introduction to where we're going tonight, and we're going to spend the, the whole time in another psalm tonight. But David launched forth in the fifth verse, and from that time forward, into some great discoveries about God. They're couched, of course, in the distress he was in, but they're very rich. And he says that God was his refuge, right there in verse 5. God is his portion. Verse 7, God is his deliverer that brings his soul out of prison. God is the one who causes him to give thanks. God is the one who provides. The God is the one who deals bountifully and sufficiently with him. And so he makes these great discoveries about God. Well, let's see his, his final analysis. Turn back to Psalm 57, and we've, we will stay there pretty much the rest of the night, making a couple of uh, little runs into some other parts of the Bible to help us see the content of those verses. But Psalm 57 is the final uh, confession of this caveman. And he's giving us the end result of acting upon those great discoveries about God. And he does so in a way that, that the Hebrew literature excels in expressing. I remember the, the difficulties learning Hebrew, but the blessings of learning about Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry is totally transferable from one language to another because Hebrew poetry is not dependent upon rhyming. Have you ever heard a poem that was translated from German to English and you kind of read it and went, huh? Or from French to English and you went, huh? It doesn't sound like a poem to me because we're used to ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
I will cry to God Most High who accomplishes. He will send forth from heaven and save me. He's accomplishing my deliverance. He's accomplishing. He's saving me. Look at verse 7. My heart is steadfast. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. He emphasizes by repetition. The next part, I will sing. Yes, I will sing. You see? The emphasis by repetition. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp. I will awaken. I will give thanks. I will sing praises. See, the, it, he just emphasizes what he learned through the doubling of these special, special discoveries he made about God. But let's go right there to verse 1 and look at them in order as we see the great discoveries about God David learned. And if you're headed toward a storm or if you're in the midst of a storm or if you're just kind of emerging from a storm in your life, then look out. There's some great discoveries about God that can be learned in that time. The first one is he discovered that God is gracious. Let's read that slowly. He said, be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me. And as he emerged from that cave, and, and we saw at the end of Psalm 142 that he was just starting to look out. He was looking beyond his enemies. He was looking beyond the rabble that was behind him, even though they were with him. Sometimes they're giving him difficulties, as we'll see in just a moment. And he starts looking away from himself. And that's some, one of the main reasons why God brings us through afflictions and through trials, to refine us, to help us look outside of ourself, outside of our own resources, outside of our own strength, and to look up at the God who was leading us and was gracious to us. His first discovery about God was that God was gracious. God is gracious to even save someone that was such a sinner and such a, a weak and evil man as he knew he was, as he expresses in the Psalms. But when we think about graciousness, there is a key passage in all the Scripture, and, and maybe you've never seen this before, so I want you to look at it with me and never get tired of turning pages. Exodus 33. I hope that you notice a, a significant wearing on your Bible because we should learn to, to be all over this book because every word of God is pure and all Scripture is profitable for us to learn from. But in Exodus 33, we're right in the midst of the golden calf incident, 32 to 34. You remember that the Israelites, as they were following Moses, sometimes when he was out of sight, was also out of mind, and so was God. And they got involved and embroiled in this great sinful time. They made a representation of God, and God hates to be worshipped in a human way. And he hates any false worship, even by true worshipers, if they come in a wrong way. And he's about ready to destroy them. And Moses is interceding, and this is one of the crucial intercessory passages of all the Scripture. Chapter 33 of Exodus, in verse 12, he starts his prayer, but look at verse 13. And in the midst of this intercession mode, Moses says this, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight, let me know thy ways. Now why do you want to know God's ways? That I may know thee. Doesn't that remind you of Psalm 103 where he says he made known his ways to Moses, but only his acts to the children of Israel? Do you see the, the distinction there? Moses was one who wanted to know God, so God showed him the way he was going. The children of Israel could have cared less sometimes, and so they just knew that, bang, God split the Red Sea. Bang, God fed them. Bang, God decimated the Egyptians and swallowed them up in the sea. They only knew his actions. But Moses knew the way he was going. And we see that expressed in his heart here. Let me know your ways that I may know thee. Kind of sounds like somebody else, doesn't it? Who does that sound like in the New Testament? The Apostle Paul, that I may know thee in the power of your resurrection. And, and the heart's cry of these who sought after God was, let me know your ways that I may know thee and find favor in thy sight. And then he starts talking to the Lord. And, and look at verse 18 of that 33rd chapter. Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. This is a significant passage. The glory of the Lord is an important thing. That is our chief end, and our, our desire of life is to glorify him 
and to reflect his glory and to be to the praise of his glory. And Moses got the idea and he says, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And the Lord talks, listen to this. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. Now, what did he say? Show me your glory. What is his glory? This is a, a key passage, learning what the glory of the Lord is. Sometimes we just think it's glowing or something, or we're not sure, it's kind of a, an uncertain thing. But God said, if you want to see my glory, I myself will make my goodness pass before you. And, listen, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Okay? Now look at verse 22. He says, And it will come to pass while my glory is passing by, that I will cover you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away from you and you'll see my back, but my face shall not be seen because it would have consumed him. Because God's glory is so holy and his power is so great that Moses could not look fully at him. And so God said, I'm going to shield you. And this is a little bit where the hymn writer talks about in the cleft of the rock where we can hide. And, and another hymn writer put it that the cleft of the rock is the riven side of Christ as he was wounded for us so that we can partake of God's glory. But that's the setting. And now here's what I want you to see in chapter 34. Because Moses said, I want to know your ways and I want to see your glory. God said, okay, you can't look at it head on, but I'm going to put you up in this little spot cover you up, kind of shield you, and then I'm going to go by and, and then I'm going to pull my hand off and as I'm going by, you're going to look at the backward or back side of me and you're going to see my glory. So the big event takes place. Moses gets up there and gets covered and, and all those things. And then verse 5 says of chapter 34, and this is magnificent. And uh, some of you that might be looking for verses to memorize, this is a good one to memorize. I, I remember... Pastor Boyd, where I used to serve down in Greenville, made us memorize this verse because he used to always, big old southern, huge preacher, he'd just quote this often. But I'll start in verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And here's old Moses, and he's doing something. where Some of this is cloaked in... in mystery, but he's calling on the name of the Lord. I don't know whether he was saying, now come by or show me or whatever he did. And the Lord passed by, verse 6, in front of him. What a marvelous thing to think, that you can know God well enough, that you can ask him a specific request. I want to see your glory, and he'll do it. And he sets up this little deal to cover you up so you don't get burnt to a crisp. And now verse 6, and the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, and here's the glory of the Lord. It's marvelous. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Wow. You want to know what the glory of the Lord is? It's the fact that He is compassionate to us who are undeserving that he is gracious to us who merit no grace, that he is slow to anger with us who so often, if he treated us like sometimes we treat others, he would burn us up in a moment, but we so often offend him and he is slow to anger. And he abounds in loving kindness, chesed, his loving loyalty to us. He's made a commitment to us. And because he made that commitment, he's going to be there kind of like the coach with the fledgling team. He makes a commitment to stick with them even if they lose every game. He's got a, a commitment there. On the eternal level, God abounds in his loving loyalty to us and his truth to us. Well, what's David talking about? Back to Psalm 57. Because that's just a brief snapshot of God's graciousness. God's graciousness is all bound up in his glory, in his compassion, in his loving loyalty to us at a high degree, on the fact that because he made a covenant with the children of Israel, he was going to see them through. Even if he had to burn up every one of them, he was going to get one through just to, to show the glory of his name that he was going to call out a people for himself. 
And David ponders all that. And as a man after God's own heart, he is echoing out there in that barren, desolate land, looking out the mouth of a cave, and he says, I've made a great discovery about you, O God. You're gracious. Have you ever met a gracious person? I'm accused these days of being too gracious. I didn't even know I was gracious, but I'm too gracious uh, because I, I am kind to people that are unkind, but... God is so gracious in an eternal degree to us. He makes us realize that we have worth in his sight because he condescends to us of low estate. He is gracious to us. He is gracious in his loving loyalty to us. He's made a covenant with us. And that covenant he made with us is not the Sinai covenant that was abrogated. He made one that will never pass away, the new covenant. And he's loyal to it. I want you to know that, that the reason why, if you don't detect a lot of human uh, systems to make people holy and righteous in, in my preaching, it's because I believe so much in the power of God. Because we are partakers of the new covenant, we have an internal prompting of God's Spirit that causes us to want to obey Him, that causes us to want to feed on His Word, that causes us to want to walk in His way. And that's because he's so gracious that his loving loyalty is toward us. And yes, we need to be exposed to God's word. But any time the Christian life is reduced to being led around and forced, it's not the life that's of God. It's not through his powerful new covenant that causes us to walk in the newness of life, energized by his spirit. And every time I see something like this, the spirit of God within me just draws me into saying with David, Oh, you are gracious to me, O God. Oh, be gracious to me. God is gracious. He is so gracious to us to even give us his attention, to even condescend to us of low estate, to even offer us salvation. Well, the caveman continues. Look at the next part of verse 1. For my soul takes refuge in thee, and in the shadow of thy wings... I will take refuge. Now, he already said this. I, you don't have to turn there, but let me turn back to Psalm 142. He repeats. I'm not the only one that repeats what I say. He repeats, too. Psalm 142, he said, I cried, O Lord, and said, Thou art my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. He comes out of the cave. He looks out again. He says the same thing. He said, In the shadow of thy wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by he said God you're my refuge if everything else fails if everything else crumbles around me you're my refuge he said it in Psalm 142 verse 5 he says it here I think one of the most beautiful anthems of God as refuge is the one you all know Psalm 91 I'd like to read you just a few verses from Psalm 91 we're not sure who wrote that could be Moses wrote it. He wrote the 90th, and they're, they're in conjunction there. But look at Psalm 91, or just listen along if you don't want to turn there. Because this is extolling God as refuge. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. And he will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you may seek refuge. That word again. His faithfulness is the shield and bulwark. And then it goes through not to be afraid of anything. And so David, and back to Psalm 57 In this psalm, in this first verse of Psalm 57, is mirroring the fact that God is our shelter, our protection, our covering, our shade. He is our refuge. How much to us now we realize somewhat of what he was anticipating. Because David, in in a moment of sin, said, Oh, don't take your spirit from me. But now we know that because of the cross, God's spirit will never be taken from us. That we have the ultimate refuge because the refuge has come to live within us. He has sealed our spirits. He has guarded our minds with that helmet of salvation we must put on. 
He is the one who is guarding the issue of our life because our loins are girt about with truth. He is the one that shields our heart from which come all the issues with the breastplate of righteousness. Through the cross, we have the ultimate refuge because of the ministry of God's Spirit. And yes, we must take up that armor. And yes, sometimes someone has to remind us to do that. I was watching or or reading uh, one of the little cartoons that comes in the Insight magazine, and and it showed a businessman, an executive, standing with his portable computer in his briefcase at the bus stop in his overcoat. And his friend says, you won't get too alarmed if I tell you something, will you? And he was standing there in his little slippers with bunnies on him because he hadn't put on his boots or his shoes. And he had his computer and he had his briefcase, but he hadn't shod his feet correctly. And yes, sometimes in the church and in the body, there is a marvelous ministry of one to another, reminding someone to shod their feet with the preparation of the gospel, to take up the sword, to take up the shield. But the energy for all that comes from the fact that we have already have moved into us the blessed Holy Spirit who makes God the refuge we can continually flee to. But let's hasten on, because verse 2 says that God accomplishes deliverance. And if you've ever been delivered from sin, and if you've ever been delivered from temptation, and if you've ever been delivered from a dark moment, and if you ever are to be delivered from any difficulty that's facing you, the only way it will be accomplished is right here in verse 2. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all. All things for me. I hear overtones of of John 15. For apart from me you can do nothing. And anything you do apart from me amounts to nothing. Because it is God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven, verse 3, and will save me. I hear Paul saying, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. There is an open door of escape, if you will be willing to take it. Because he will send from heaven. He will save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. And David now starts into a series of reminders of what he's going through. He says here he's being trampled upon. But in the midst of that trampling, the end of verse 3 says, and that's the amplification of the start of verse 2, God saves, he accomplishes, Because he says here, God will send forth his loving kindness. Ah, there's that word again. His loving loyalty to us. His faithfulness because we belong to him. He's going to send his loving kindness and his truth. What a blessing to know that when we're getting trampled on, that God is there. He is accomplishing his purpose in us. He is sending from heaven. He is saving us. But now look at verse 4 because we go into something that that I think is fascinating and maybe it will be very timely for us right now as some of the troubled hearts need to realize verses 4, 5, and 6, what they're talking about. Because here's David who fled to this cave to get away from Saul and all the armies of Israel that were searching around trying to get him. He's running from the Philistines And he comes there, and all these people say, we're coming here with you. You're our captain, David. You're our leader, David. You're our brother. You're our son. There were all types of family relationships because his family came, and also all these discontents and malcontents and indebted people. And they've all huddled in this cave, and now David gives us a brief insight into what it's like inside the family. All these people were supposed to be together. They're they're following him. He's their leader. And look what he says. Because here's what the other cavemen are doing. Here God is refining David. David's running for his life. These people look to him for leadership. And while he's trying to lead them, look what they're doing to him in the cave. In verse 4. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Doesn't sound very pleasant in the cave, does it? Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. He says there's a little interlude in his reflections on God and he says, you know, there's an enemy without. They said there's also an enemy within. Because in the hard times, some of them weren't responding correctly 
And they were becoming like predators on him. They were like lions. They, those that he was laying among as he lived in that cave were breathing forth fire. Reminds me a little bit of James 3 who says the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue can set on fire the course of nature. And sometimes that tongue is set on fire of hell. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the image of God. Behold how great a matter a little fire can kindle, James reminds us. And he says here, David echoes that. He says their tongues are a sharp sword. Well, what does he do in, that, in the midst of that? Does he go and knock their teeth out? Does he throw them out of the cave? No. What does he do in verse 5? He just takes his focus and he goes like this, looks up, and I guess that's one way to deal with it. And uh, some people wonder why I don't say more about all the unrest in the church. Well, I just see a biblical admonition that if God is at work in our midst, as long as I keep my focus, verse 5, be exalted above the heavens, O God, let thy glory be above all the earth. You see, our focus is to be on God. And if we find difficulties, we already know the test. It says in 1 John 4, we're to test the spirits. And I would just uh, share with you, here's a personal note from me to you all. Uh, I think I'll read from James 3. And you don't even have to turn there. But we're in a time which is uh, unparalleled in the church. And uh, I've actually had to have a group of overseers who have been appointed to meet the accusations of people in this congregation, which are false, I will tell you. Not one person has brought up a true accusation so far. And I've actually had to have a, a group of overseers to meet with them. But listen, if you want to test the spirits, James said this, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, and that word selfish ambition is the rising up and trying to be in control in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Whenever there is striving and whenever there is this accusatory nature that comes upon Christians, God says it's not from above. It is earthly, it is natural, yes, it's human, but it's not from God. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But here's the wisdom that is from above. It's pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, even when it gets rough and without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. If you want to see what's of God, it's that which tends toward peace, love, faith, hope. Not discontent, not disorder, not breathing fire, not tongues as sharp as swords, but a focus, back to Psalm 57, 5, of being exalted above the heaven, O God. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Well, then he goes back to his woes in verse 6. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. But here comes God saving him again in verse 6. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. And something very important for us to remember is when God is in control that even the devices prepared by men, nets for our steps, pit for our souls, God will overturn. And he will bring forth in righteousness his word and his people. But now look at verse 7, because we come now to the fourth of David's discoveries about God. We already saw that he saw that God was gracious, God was a refuge, God would accomplish deliverance, he hoped in that. But now verse 7 Notice the em emphasis again. My heart is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. He says here that God establishes. And you don't need to turn there, but whenever you think of God establishing, you think of the 40th Psalm. As he said, you have taken me out of the miry clay and put me on a rock. That is establishing. 
Salvation is when God digs us out of the miry clay and puts us upon the rock, Christ Jesus. He said, God, my heart is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. You have established me. The end of verse 7, I will sing. Yes, I will sing. You know what he says he discovered about God? That God makes us to praise through sorrow. Spurgeon said some people owe the great beauty of their lives to the extreme difficulties that they've come through. And I've told you before, he's one of the men I've loved to learn about. The Prince of Preachers in the English language was one of the most depressed men you ever had seen. He used to have to go to the seacoast just to recover enough strength to go back and face the congregation again. And his wife used to have to practically drag him because he was such a melancholic man. And yet he learned that out of his sorrow and out of his grief, as David said in Psalm 57, 7, the second half, I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. And David said, out of the cave out of the distress, outside the cave, inside the cave, in my very soul, he says, I will sing praises to you. Look at verse 8. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. He's thinking about the days he used to be on the hillsides. He thinks about when he used to be a shepherd. I will awaken at the dawn. I will give thanks to thee among the peoples. He said, God makes me thankful. That's why we can smile in sorrow That's why we can be joyful and not melancholic and and sad because God makes us thankful. He makes us thankful that he is working all things together for good. But the second part of 9, we find another one because the God who was gracious, the God who was a refuge, the God who was accomplishing deliverance, the God who had established him and made him steadfast, and the God who made him praise through sorrow, not only made him thankful, but he gives him an audience. Look at the end of verse 9. I will sing praises to thee among the nations. Now that's hilarious to think of. This guy in the Judean wilderness in a cave with 400 malcontents is going to sing praises to the nations? Do you see he got a perspective here? Here he is off in the corner running for his life and he said, I'm starting to get the big picture. God, you're running running me through the ringer so that I can sing praises on God's behalf to the nations, among the people. I will sing praises to thee among the nations. And God opens an audience for him. And you know who the nations are at this very moment? Us. You're right now reaping the benefit of David's cave times. That was uh, 3,000 years ago he wrote this down. And tonight we can reap the rewards.